I don't either. I'm trying to I'm trying to figure that out myself. <laughs> hey, Johnny.
Right, well, welcome to worship. Sorry, Julie, sorry to throw you off there. Sorry about that. There we go. Now, it, it all works. Uh, welcome, welcome all to worship. So glad to have you here with us. I believe the only, are there, are there any other announcements? Are there any announcements? Okay, the only, only one to repeat was Jane Saddle cannot be here with us here this morning, uh, but she did write to me to say, remember to write prayer requests on those strips and put them in the offering plate, plate and bring bags for um, feeding of the multitudes. Kelly. Kelly. Yeah, we're going to have a Kairos report right before uh, our congregational prayer. So uh, that went well from what I heard. So we'll, we'll hear more details about that. Looking forward to it, Adair. Make sure everybody's got the barbecue on their calendar for the last Saturday in October. Last Saturday in October, barbecue, um, five, to five to eight. Mm-hmm. Sounds good, Mission. sounds good. Mission fundraiser. Mission fundraiser, so y'all remember that. Come by and get a plate of barbecue uh, and uh, support the ministry here. Well, let us all stand, please, and let us praise our Lord here this morning. Our call to worship comes from Psalm 98. I'll read the regular print together. Corporately, we'll recite the bold. This is God's Word. This is our King calling us into His presence to worship Him this morning. And it reads this. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. For He has done marvelous things. His right hand and His holy arm have worked salvation for Him. The Lord has made known His salvation. He has revealed His righteousness in the sight of the nations. He has remembered his steadfast love and faithfulness to the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Break forth into joyous song and sing praises. Sing praises to the Lord with the lyre, with the lyre and the sound of melody. With trumpets and the sound of the horn, make a joyful noise before the King, the Lord. Let the sea roar and all that fills it the world, and those who dwell in it. Let the rivers clap their hands. Let the hills sing for joy together before the Lord. For He comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with equity. Let us pray. So, Father, we thank You for calling us here this morning. We thank You for this wonderful call. Lord, there are so many distractions that can so play into our minds here on this Your day, on this Your hour. Lord, this is the market day place for the soul. This is the place we get nourishment and sustenance for the week. And so, Lord, I pray that you'd remove from us these distractions, these reminders of of sins of past, these reminders of events coming up, whatever may be the case. Lord, by your spirit, I pray that you would form, shape, and mold us into a people ready to worship this morning. And Lord, may you take and receive this worship. Make it acceptable in your sight. May we not forget the words that you yourself taught your disciples to pray when you taught them, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Well, let us do just as uh, we're told to do by the psalmist in Psalm 98. It says to sing to the Lord a new song for he has done marvelous things. Let us do that with hymn number 223, Crown Him with Many Crowns.
church gathered, it's good to, good to recite certain truths we hold together as a community of faith. And this week it comes from the Confession of Faith, chapter 27. I'm using some license. The Confession of Faith is not worded in question form, but it, its answer is so good about the sacrament, which we'll be partaking in this morning. So the question is, how are we to understand the grace in the sacraments? The grace revealed in or by sacraments in their right use does not come from any power in them. Neither does the effectiveness of a sacrament depend on the devoutness or the intention of whoever administers it. Rather, the spirit effectiveness of the sacraments are the results of the work of the Spirit and rest on God's Word instituting them, since His Word authorizes their use and promises benefits to worthy receivers of them. Amen. Please be seated. I just love that part there about the effectiveness does not depend on the devoutness or intent of the one administering it. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord for that. Well, as we come to worship, we are also going to confess our sins, and that is found there in, uh, in, in your bulletin. Our prayer of confession is done togetherly as a corporate gathered people. But I want you to look especially at the verse of pardon. Acts 13, 36-39 says this, and this is a speech, I believe, from Peter. He says this, For David, after he had served the purpose of God in his own generation, fell asleep and was laid with his fathers and saw corruption. But he whom God raised up did not see corruption. Let it be, let it be known to you, therefore, brothers, that through this man forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. And by him, everyone who believes is freed from everything from which you could not be freed by the law of Moses. Now, there we go. You can't be saved by your behavior. You can't make it to where God says, I have to save you because you're so good. It doesn't work like that. No, in fact, it's all by grace. Praise the Lord. The pressure is off of you. You rely on the righteousness of another. You rely on the righteousness of and perfect obedience of Christ Jesus by faith, we're forgiven. So let us go to this great God who forgives sins in our prayer of confession. Let us pray together. We confess to you, affectionate and forgiving God, that we oftentimes alter your message. We choose which parts to confess and only obey the parts that don't ask too much of us. We seek your forgiveness for disobeying your word And we openly admit our transgressions before you. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. And so it is, Father, we give you the next few moments in silent confession. Lord, we could be here for quite some time. Uh, God, uh, there's ample evidence uh, that we have given our hearts to things that uh, are not worthy of giving our hearts to. Uh, Lord, we confess that uh, we, we externally, we look for something to attach our identity onto, and then we ask that thing to do things for us, to accomplish righteousness. And Lord, that is certainly true in, uh, here in the southern United States on a fall Saturday. Lord, forgive us, God, for taking your great gifts and turning them into ultimate Forgive us, Lord, for loving the gift more than the gift giver. Uh, Father, forgive us for these and many sins. Forgive us for how this gets worked out in our life. Forgive us, Lord, for the times where we have been short with our neighbor. We have not loved our neighbor as ourself, or we have not loved you with our whole heart. So, God, I ask your forgiveness for the many times and ways in which that has been worked out this past week. God, I pray that... Uh, Lord, that we would see ourselves rightly, that we would see ourselves in the righteousness of Christ, that we would understand more and more by your Spirit that there's nothing we can do. Just as your servant told those people in the book of Acts, could, we cannot be freed by the law of Moses. We cannot do, we cannot accomplish, we cannot reach sinlessness that has been done for us by the person and work of Christ. Now, pray, God, that we would rest in that, uh, stop the striving, Put our deadly doing down and rest in the finished work of Christ. We ask this, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Is that something outside or is that something in the AV system? That's what now? 
Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. No, you're fine. You're fine. You're fine. I didn't know if that was us. Please. I didn't know if that was us. No, keep it going. Keep it going. Keep it going. No. Uh, keep it going, please. Just want to make sure we're good. All right. Well, we come now to pray uh, for our people. And Adair, if you don't mind, sir, can you give us a report on Kairos? Awesome, awesome. And for those um, maybe new with us, Kairos is a prison ministry that we've been doing for quite some time. It just started back up, and uh, you go right into the prison itself. 
and for three, four days, three, four, four days, you're there getting to know these guys very well. And uh, some do turn and, and place faith in Christ. Uh, but as you can imagine, that is quite the process to un, uh, the b- process of undoing a lot of sin patterns and being sinned against is very, it, it's heavy. And so we praise the Lord that, that the Lord is faithful to use that week, this week with them. Well, um, I'll, I'll take that on. I want to pray for Kairos and I also want to pray for Jane Settle. Uh, Jane's doing well. She just can't make it here and she's, she's just fighting a cold or something. So uh, she just told me via text, can't be there fighting the crud, and so please make this announcement. So I'll pray for Jane. Um, anybody else we can pray for here this morning? Jane, uh, Micah. Any report on that? or Okay. All right. Brian, you mind taking that? Okay. Anybody else? And then... Shannon trying to get that house fixed. Walker? And remind me what's going on with Walker. Walker was born with the first time. And so he's been in the now. He's been better, but he still has a lot of work to do. Certainly. Anybody would like to pray for it? Thank you, Adair. Thank you. Well, seeing no, no others, let us now go to our great God in prayer. Ryan, if you start. Oh, I'm sorry. Is there... Oh, I'm sorry, Marty. Sorry. I am so sorry. I thought that was our own mic or so. That is a very big deal. So there's speech therapy available to the girls now through MUSC. We praise the Lord for that being available. And it was sort of miraculous how it was able to occur. Uh, and so nothing random in, in life. And we praise the Lord for him directly handing a gift like that to, to the girls and to you. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Who would like to take that one? Greg? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Who would like to pray here? For, thank you, Rod. Thank you, Rod. And Greg? That's my friend, uh, Martin Conway, is with us from Kenya this morning. Uh, he is a uh, pastor from Kenya. I met him on a Holy Land trip several years ago. And he leads a seminary in, uh, near Nairobi. And I, I'd like to lift him up in prayer with our church for his own hand of teaching in seminary and to be a uh, speaker. Certainly. Pleasure to have you here with us and your family. Pleasure to have you. I'll take that one. So, passion, passion. Joan? Israel and Palestine. Thank you for a reminder. Who would like to take the, I mean, that's a pretty heavy one. Uh, who would like to pray for the, good, thank you, Sandy. Marguerite? Certainly. A lot of civil unrest in Guatemala. Certainly. Certainly. Would you, Sandy, would you mind going with the international 
prayer. Add that one to it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. World peace. Well, Ryan, if you don't mind starting, and we'll, we'll go from there. Heavenly Father, uh, thank you so much uh, for who you are and what you did for us, Lord, and for the world. Uh, right now, I just want to pray for our brother Doug. Uh, he can be running you, Lord, and uh, helping a group that, that is uh, just exploding uh, when it comes to your spirit there, Lord. And I pray that you give him safety. Lord God, only your power can break that bondage. 
please work on it for them. Because only you can, or just go into the hearts of men and all this conflict. No matter, no diplomat, no skilled politician, no organ, no one really brings people together, but you can by your Holy Spirit by working in hearts and people. So we just lift all these countries up. And, and Lord God, Lord God, we thank you that we can talk to you. We thank you that you know, even though we don't understand, you have all things under control. Help us to continue to walk by faith as we do walk and as we look around and see this craziness. Help us to cling even closer to you because the craziness that has come will come even more to our shores as well. Lord God. Yes, Lord. Father, we, we do echo the, a hearty amen to all that's been prayed for and about. And Lord, we thank you for having our brother here with us, Martin. Uh, thank you for the work he's done in Kenya and uh, there in the seminary and also as pastor. And we pray that you continue to bless the uh, fruit of his hands, the labor of his hands. Lord, that you go before him, uh, that no plan or scheme of the evil one would try to thwart or be able to thwart what you're doing there. We pray, Lord, that you just provide a good time of uh, rest uh, and uh, meeting and old acquaintances here while he is in the States, he and his family. And we pray, God, that you'd go before him, uh, Lord, that many would come to know Christ and his saving power through his, his ministry. Lord, we also thank you for this church. We ask your continued guidance and sustaining here at Rockville Presbyterian. Uh, Lord, I <clears throat> thank you that... We're, we're gathered here to hear your word. I pray, Lord, by your spirit that you would enable us to have ears to hear, that we would respond to it by faith. That we that we'd cherish your word, Lord, that we'd take it in upon ourselves and that our lives would be different because of this, because of our worship of you. So, Lord, I pray for the remainder of our service, especially as we come to the table. God, these visible, um, your visible word, as it, as it is called, Lord, that you would remind us of the gospel promises we have in Christ Jesus, and that would not just be there, but rather it would have a transforming effect in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, let us worship God through the giving of tithes and offerings this morning. Remember, God loves a cheerful giver. It's not you have to give, nothing of that sort at all. It's you get to give. And so let us worship God through the giving of tithes and offerings here this morning. stand for our doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son,
Lord, we thank you for being so generous to us, giving us the ability to give back to you. It's already yours. And so, Lord, we pray that you would take these, these are these gifts and tithes and offerings. Use them, Lord, to mightily impact your kingdom for the glory of Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. 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 Please be seated. I, I invite you to turn into our last portion of 1 Timothy, well, the epistle of 1 Timothy. And we'll be in chapter 6, the last few verses. Uh, if you have a pew Bible, I believe it is 993. And this is verse 11 of 1 Timothy 6. This is God's word. Let us hear it. 1 Timothy 6, verse 11. But as for you, O man of God, flee these things. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, gentleness. Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called, about which you made the good confession in the, abs- in the presence of many witnesses. Charge you in the presence of God, who gives life to all things, And of Christ Jesus, who is the testimony before Pontius Pilate, made the good confession to keep the commandment uh, unstained and free from reproach to the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he will display at the proper time. He who is a blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, who alone has immortality, who dwells in unapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen nor can see. To him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, and to be generous and ready to share, thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future, so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. O Timothy, guard the deposit entrusted to you. Avoid the irreverent babble and contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge. For by professing it, some have swerved from the faith. Grace be with you. Well, that is the ending of our reading and the ending of 1 Timothy. And we're done with it. Uh, But let me ask you a question. Have you ever played a game with a child who makes up the rules as they go? (laughs) Who wins? The child wins. (laughs) The saying goes, you want to be clear on where you're going. Flexible on how you get there. It's always good to know the rules of engagement before getting into any sort of mission or anything like that. We need this clear, here's what you do type of training for really important tasks. As a a youth football player in my glory days, fifth and sixth grade, uh, we had uh, an assistant coach on staff who uh, maybe was there for the wrong reasons, maybe to live through the glory of our pads. Uh, But um, he was an assistant. He had to take the reins one game, and he told us, our, our stirring pregame speech was just go out there and win. There was no direction, nothing like that, and we got mercy ruled. There was no direction. It was chaos. We didn't know what we were doing. But uh, that's sort of what I'm talking about. Maybe you remember on a more serious note, the military operation that came to be known as Black Hawk Down. Two Black Hawk helicopters came crashing down in the middle of Mogadishu. Chaos and confusion followed. Our fighters didn't know who's the enemy, who's the friendly. Soldiers were captured. It became every man for himself. And after the fighting ended, our army was left wandering around the streets, wondering what just happened. Here's a big takeaway. Every party has to know the guidelines in combat. You have to know. When communication broke down, the U.S. Army then became like the children making up their own game. Where are the rules? What are you supposed to do? I don't know. You know how that works. So here in the final section of 1 Timothy, Paul tells Timothy, hey, here's the rules of engagement. And a final plea before it all sums up. And when the church forgets these rules, we forget who the real enemy is. We start fighting one another. Chaos and confusion happen. This is that section of the Bible that says fight the good fight. Now, there's two sections, but this is one of them. Fight the good fight. We typically have this as a maybe like a mantra for somebody going through a rough time. And there's nothing wrong with applying it there, but contextually, well, we'll get to that. It's actually about something totally different. So here we are in the first section of 1 Timothy. Paul is wrapping up the letter. And three points to consider here this morning. Paul, Paul takes, he talks about a turn. There's our first point. We're going to make a turn, or he's talking about a turn. He then trolls the culture at large. You want to talk about that? And then he talks about certain temptations. 
expectations that are to follow. If you heard while we were reading the text, Paul is like a lot of ministers. He gives the benediction and he goes, oh, one other thing, and the rich, you know, we, we just can't stop it. Uh, so turn, troll, and temptations. That's where we're going. Let's look at our first section here, uh, verse 11, our turn. But as for you, O man of God, flee these things. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, gentleness. Fight the, fight, the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called about, which you were made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. I charge you, in the presence of God, who gives life to all things, and of Christ Jesus, who, is, who in his testimony before Pontius Pilate made the good confession to keep the commandment unstained and free from reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. There's, there's our first section. Now, notice in verse 11, flee. And then the corresponding is pursue. You can't simply turn away from one thing without turning towards something else. Fleeing means you pursue something else. In 1984, we had an eclipse. I was a little first grader, and uh, we were going outside, and it was a partial eclipse, and the teacher told us, do not look in the, in the sky. What do a bunch of six-year-olds do? Yeah. Uh, do not look up at the sky. And, and, and how that teacher expressed that was, look at the grass. Look at the dirt. In fact, you're going to look somewhere else. Uh, don't look at that thing. But that, don't look at that thing wasn't good enough. You're going to have to look towards something else. This is the charge in the first point. I love what Philip Ryken, he's a pastor who's uh, now in glory, wrote this. If all we do is run away from one sin... We will run right into the arms of another. The human heart is like a popular ride at an amusement park. Sins are lined up at the entrance, waiting for a chance to get on and enjoy the ride. And Satan is happy for a sin to get off and ride every now and then, provided another sin can climb on there. So a man finally masters sexual temptation, but then he becomes a glutton. Or a woman learns to control her tongue, but she still harbors proud and jealous thoughts. Real growth and godliness means more than just trading one sin for another. That's a good point. There's a pursue aspect to our turning from sin that we forget sometimes. Now, yeah, turn from sin, but don't turn to another sin. Here's the twofold call to Timothy. Retreat and pursue. Pursue all those characteristics. Righteousness, good godliness, faith, love, steadfastness. I wish we had time to look at all of these, but let's just look at the first two. What are we to pursue? Righteousness and godliness. Uh, what is, uh, how do we do that? What, what does that look like? Well, this is conduct according to God's will. This is what pleases him. Paul isn't calling these people to, to muster up a certain amount of morality or something like that within their own strength. The Christian life isn't like a Christmas tree where you externally place things on the tree from the outside. No. No, we don't just adorn ourselves with good works. It's a tree grown through the wintertime. It produces buds, meaning there's life in the trunk. The life of Christ, as it goes through the believer, will evidence itself out in many ways. It's more organic. It's not simply putting on external works and saying, look at me. It's more inward. Pursue what God by His Spirit is determined to produce. As soon as we put our hands to the plow, we'll realize something. God is working by His Spirit in us. Pursue righteousness and godliness. And this isn't a, 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 a call to become good, in quotes. No, it's a call to become what you already are in Christ. Notice, too, the call to fight the good fight. Now, is it, uh, there's a, this isn't a call to go out there and fight culture wars, although, uh, yes, indeed, we need to stand up in a culture that becomes more antagonistic to Scripture and sure. But if we're going to have to pick a fight, it's about doctrine within the church. That's the context at large. Remember the false teachers. They were just mentioned in the previous text. Here's a strange truth about the church. I, can, I can't quite figure this out, but it's, all, it's universal. Sound doctrine doesn't remain if you're passive. It rather has to be fought for actively. So if you did nothing, hands off, and just let the church go as it goes, it will veer and drift towards unorthodox, unbiblical views. It's just how it goes. Left of itself, it will drift towards unorthodoxy. It's the strangest thing. Left to itself, it will always do that. So the remaining true to the word requires warfare. This is Timothy 
Timothy's call to arms here. Timothy and the church, be on guard when you hear the hiss of the garden. Did God really say that was the original battle? He didn't really mean that. He was challenging God's word. So when the substitutionary atoning work of Christ is questioned, when the depravity of humanity is questioned, when the holiness of God is questioned within the church, you've got to pick up your sword, sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. My former denomination, orthodox as they come, I love them, and, and there's nothing, nothing at all uh, unbiblical about them. Uh, but one, the second largest in that denomination had about 2,000 members in their heyday about 25 years ago. If you were to step into that church today, there's 35 worshipers. What happened? A culture of niceness that doesn't want to say anything, passivity in, in, the, in the response that's needed uh, when, when unorthodoxy starts to rear its head, that's what causes 1,970 members to leave in a two-year period. Uh, they, it, uh, it happens a lot, sadly, when a church starts to veer theologically. True believers in that church will say to, to the leadership, uh, you're not going to do anything? And that's what happens. Happens a lot, sadly. And that's what Timothy is told to do. It's not owning the libs. It, was, it wasn't scoring points politically. That's not what it was talking about. It was make sure biblical sketchiness isn't tolerated. Make sure you don't listen to that hiss. Did God really say? And you go, well, you got a point there. No, shut it down and fight the good fight, Timothy. So on a personal level, here's how I will apply this. Uh, we have this category. We all have this category in our life. I need to work on this. We all have that. We all. It's a grab bag of things that we know are not lined up with with how God would have us live our lives. Approach those things with the same mindset. Pers uh, flee it and pursue it. Turn from it, turn towards something else. Not just stop doing this thing, rather pursue righteousness. Pursue what God is already working in you. Secondly, I, I just ask that you pray for us as the elders here at this church. It, it's not so much winning arguments on the internet with unbelievers. That's not what he's saying. Fighting for orthodoxy. May we never, ever be charged with putting down our swords. There's way too much at stake. So pray for the elders, encourage, keep fighting the good fight. Now, let's look at our section of trolling. Paul here just burst into what seems like uh, an impromptu doxology, just kind of just praises God from nowhere, it seems. Verse 15, latter part, He who is a blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone has immortality, who dwells in unapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen nor can see. To him be honor and, and eternal dominion. Amen. He just kind of just does that out of nowhere, it seems like. But let's look at why he does it in some of these terms. Blessed. Let's look at that first thing about God. Blessed. Who alone is, um, who is blessed and only sovereign. Now, We've just gone through this in uh, Sunday school, maybe a, a couple months ago. The Beatitudes. What does blessed mean? Uh, anybody? Ryan, you can say it. Okay, happy. Uh, happy, content, we're good. God is that. He is happy. Think about that. With God, there is no frustration. There's no anxiety within the Godhead. Because He controls everything. And everything's going exactly how he wants it to go. Why should he worry when he controls everything? He's totally content because he's totally in control. Yes, he does display emotions such as anger, love, compassion, but that never affects his mind with worry. So we, as God's people, why are we walking around as a ball of frustration and anxiety when God is perfectly happy? We forget this. We need to be reminded God is absolutely sovereign, absolutely happy, absolutely content. Uh, to quote Kevin DeYoung, great um, PCA minister in Charlotte, says this, For many Christians, coming to grips with God's all-encompassing providence requires a massive shift in how they look at the world. It requires changing our vantage point from seeing the created world as a place where man rules and God responds to beholding a universe where God creates and constantly controls with sovereign love and providential power. That's a good quote. That is the God we're talking about. Next thing, not only is he blessed, he's the king of kings and lord of lords. Here's a better literal way to say it. He's the king of those kinging and the lord of those lording. The word is literally 
dunamis, where we get the word dynamite. He's a powerful king. He is the true king over those calling themselves kings. And if that's true, guess what? I don't have anything to be, be in fear of because he's at the top of the mountain controlling. There is no one trying to control me who can defeat him. Let's think about the king of the mountain. There's no one trying to control me uh, who can defeat him. This should encourage you. Every time we're tempted to say, why in the world would this happen? We can remind ourselves of the king of kings and lord of lords rather than fret and worry. And we'll have to wait and see what he does with the situation. I'm reminded of Joseph. Think about that. Pretty much his entire life up to that point had been, we could call it, bat, uh, a hard providence after hard providence. And there he has his brothers when he say, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. God meant it for good. So why, is this a, 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 why does Timothy need to, to hear this? He's right in the middle of a place where they're going to start worshiping Caesar. They wait till him to die. You can't worship him while he's alive because you see all his faults. But once he dies, we're going to worship him. So that, that starts in Ephesus. And now Paul goes, uh, after saying all these things, you're scared of Caesar? You're going to be scared of Caesar now? Timothy, buddy, the real king doesn't have to threaten people with death for bowing or not bowing. Stay strong. What's the next attribute? Immortal. God is deathless. He's incapable of death. He is the everlasting God. He's outside of time. He's unaffected by death. He is outside of history. He's bigger than history. He was here before history. He'll be here after history. He possesses eternity. We have endless life because he chooses to give it to us. The last attribute, he dwells in unapproachable light. In a word, he is holy. He is holy. He consumes everything that is unholy from his presence. He is so far removed from sin and sinners. He cannot sin. He can only act with perfect righteousness 100% of the time. So here's the part again where he's trolling. You can hear Paul going after all these attributes, and you're scared of Caesar? Because all these are the reverse negative of the governing authorities throughout the ages who tells the church to be quiet. The doxology reminds us of a, uh, us, the church, where there are videos that are really hard to watch, particularly this week that came out. They are not the king of kings. They are not the lord of those lording. They are not holy. They are not unapproachable. They will, uh, those sins that we're viewing will either, they'll be paid for, They'll be paid for at the cross of Christ if there's repentance, or they'll be paid in eternity. But at no point are we given the option of cowering in fear because we serve a God who has all those attributes. Caesar had the same line, and that's, that's really it. He called himself king of kings. Paul knows exactly what he's doing. He's choosing these words carefully. Timothy, you know the king of kings. This is a conscious rebuttal to emperor worship. So here's how we can apply this impromptu doxology. Next time you're tempted to give power and control over your life to another, we call this approval addiction. Next time you're uh, tempted to say, um, this is, approval addiction is kind of like one of these things where there's an invisible line attached to others. And we just say, what do you need me to do so that, I have, uh, so that I have some acceptance in your eyes? What do you need me to do? Next time we're tempted with that, remember this doxology. Next time peer pressure is at your door. Next time something like that ha happens, remember this great God of 1 Timothy 6. Are they unapproachable holy? Everyone in here has a Caesar. We might be tempted to simply offer submission to. The truth is we need to come back to this doxology and remember this. The fear of man is a snare. Here's where freedom is found. Praising the only one worthy of it. So our last point, temptation. Here's the final thing Paul reminds Timothy. Apparently this, this congregation has some movers and shakers. Uh, they needed to hear something before the final amen. Again, you could tell Paul's a pastor. He does all the talking benediction. Oh, wait, one other thing. Um, with regards to money, here are two temptations we Christians face. Verse 17, instruct the rich not to set their hope on the uncertainty of riches, but on God who richly supplies us with all things to enjoy. Two different paths here. Here's the first path. Make money ultimate to place all our hope and security in these green pieces of paper. Money, as we'll find out later, is a wonderful servant, but a tyrannical master. Don't be mastered by money because it's so uncertain. 
Just, just how uncertain? Well, 1923, nine of the world's wealthiest men came together, held a meeting in Chicago. In attendance were largest steel, gas, utility, the president of the New York Stock Exchange, uh, as well as one other Wall Street tycoon. They met with the intent of combining resources, manipulating the market so that they could keep their share of wealth. I know it's hard to believe that, but... <laughs> They shared a lavish lifestyle. They shared bank accounts with more zeros we can count. They were the, the elite. Within one decade, all nine had either lost it, were in jail, or taken their own life. Markets are uncertain. Economies crash, but God is certain. God's provision never fails. Some of this hits clo close to home. It was about 20-some years ago. Uh, there was a... Can you go to a Blockbuster anymore? No. But about 20-something years ago, the representatives of Blockbuster had people come into their office. It was, it was a new startup company called Netflix. They were not doing so well, and they offered to sell at a discount price their model. And they got laughed out. That'll never work. Get out of here. And within five years, it switched. Blockbuster comes in with their hands, hat in their hand, pleat. Get out of here. That's the uncertainty of wealth and money should not have your ultimate trust and security. Also, don't purchase things with the sole intent of impressing people. Take care you don't use your blessings from God in such a way to look down on others. That's the first. Now, here's the second one. Here's the other aspect. Here's the deal with this charge. It assumes that God blesses Christians with wealth, sometimes a lot of wealth. And feeling guilty about the wealth is as just as much a sin as feeling greedy about the wealth. So you have guilt on one end and greed on the other. Avoid those. Because the very next portion says, Don't set your home, hope and confidence on riches. Set it on God who richly blesses you with everything to enjoy. So two charges. A rejection of the prosperity gospel. And a rejection of what's called the austerity gospel. It rejects God's blessing and wealth and says... I'm never going to be able to enjoy this. Both mindsets, greed and guilt, are unselfish and ungrateful and from the father of lies. God blesses you. Awesome. Thank him for it. Enjoy it. And as you enjoy it, your heart should have one reaction. It should say, this is so wonderful, I have to share it. That is the demeanor for the Christian. We receive the blessings from God and say to ourselves, this is so good, I want others to have it. But right now, there's an underbelly of false guilt that seems to be approaching the church. Don't fall for it. It seems super spiritual. Don't fall for that. If you have a car newer than 2005, you should feel guilty. No. There's a weird thing in Western Christianity that feels bad for having. That wealth and material blessing is a disease. Well, if that's the case, don't share the disease with anybody else. Why would you want to give it away? It's a disease, right? I hate to say this, there are some Christian organizations that will send a letter in the mail that looks like, a, looks like it's from somebody you know. And you open it, and sometimes they'll have like a bloody hand or something on there um, asking for money to give. Uh, and if you throw that thing in the trash, you are a murderer. That's the idea. Uh, or think about commercials sometimes used to run many years ago, pictures of children. And then they look at you and say, for just a cup of coffee, you rich Westerner. Now, is God pleased with guilt as a motivation? He's not. Nowhere in Scripture is guilt harnessed and weaponized to say, now give. Give out of your abundance, don't give out of your guilt. You know why? Because if we're given out of our guilt, the next question is, how much do I have to give? And the answer is, just enough to make the guilt go away. And you don't want to play that game either. Give out of your abundance. It's, guilt is a horrible motivation. And let me add, not pleasing to God. We parents do this sometimes. It's comparable. When one child does one thing against another child, we force an apology, and the apology is done. Looking at the floor and still angry. Now say you're sorry. Sorry. Is that real? No. <laughs> Same way with guilt-based giving. Is that really pleasing to God? Is that really from the heart? Or is that just to say, this will make me feel a little bit better? This will, this will keep the guilt away for a month. So here's the final part to 1 Timothy. Turn from ungodliness. Turn towards righteousness. Don't worry about Caesar. And one other thing, cultivate a right understanding of blessing and wealth in your congregation. Here's the gospel in 1 Timothy. We have the table before us. The invincible God, 
Let's go back to that doxology. The invincible God was beaten. He had guards mock him. He had them pull out hair from his beard. That's the invincible God. We see him getting beat up in the Gospels. The immortal God dies on a cross. He's crucified. The God who can't be approached took on flesh and approached us. He took on flesh and came near. That the God who is invincible, invisible, made visible to our eyes. If you've seen Christ, you've seen the Father. This means the Father is invisible, it can't be approached, but all these things, in a sense, don't matter because he became flesh and tabernacled in the incarnation. That's the gospel. Jesus is the way to the Father. And when you look at the cross, when you see Him coming out of the grave, we're seeing everything you need to know about the Father. When you come to Jesus, you come to the Father, the glory of the Father has been adapted to our creaturely level, to quote another pastor. So if our thoughts are filled with this great God who did so much for us, and we're taken up, and we see His creation, and we say it to the one who spoke all this into existence. Universes come from when he speaks, remember. Then you go in and open your checkbook. Now you have the right perspective. You're only giving because of how great he is and what he's done for you. Let us pray to this great God. Lord, we thank you. Thank you for giving us, uh, giving to us, Lord. Not just material blessing, but Lord, you've given us Christ. And as we come to this table, I pray, God, by faith, we receive it. And it would change us, God, that it would change us into, um, as your word says, one form to another, Christ Jesus, into his likeness. So, Lord, help us to see ourselves rightly. Help us to see you rightly. And that we may uh, offer our praise to you as a result. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, let us sing before coming to the table. And we will sing our hymn of preparation. Holy Spirit, living breath of God, 746. Let's please stand as we sing 746.
We can see it. And it is with great joy and honor to invite you to the table, uh, the table of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, yeah, we're good. Um, so I get to invite you to this table, the table of our Lord Jesus Christ. Notice it didn't say this is a table of a denomination. It's not the table of a local church. This is Christ's table. And all who place their faith in Christ are invited to come and partake. It is a blessing to the church. And Paul says in 1 Corinthians, it can be a curse for those who receive it the wrong way. The divisions were happening all over that church. There was pride and breakdown of relationships. And people were getting drunk coming to the table. And they were coming with the expectation that this is, a, this is something that I deserve. Uh, and as one theologian put it, you don't want what you deserve. Um, you, you want what's given to you in grace and mercy. So if uh, you come and know that you need this, you need the body broken and bloodshed, please come and partake. Uh, if you know yourself to be a sinner in need of his grace, this table is for you, and I invite you here. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for the elements before us. We thank you for the bread broken. We thank you for uh, the blood shed and, and the juice. And Lord, we ask your blessing on our time of administering the Lord's Supper. Uh, Lord, we pray that right now in this moment, these elements would be taken away from their common usage and uh, Lord, special usage, usage. There's nothing in these things which make them miraculous, which make them supernatural or anything like that. Lord, this all is a means of grace that points to the body broken and bloodshed. And we thank you for it. And Lord, I pray that this would be a, a blessing to us uh, equipping us and energizing us for the work you have for us ahead. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, if you're new with us, um, we, we come up from the back, and there will be two elders on each side. And uh, Carl, you're okay right there if y'all don't mind, Adair and Rod. If y'all are good coming on this side, and Ryan, you and I will be on this side. And We ask that you come and grab both. Uh, yes, Oh, yeah. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, and uh, that would not have been fuzzy math. Sorry about that. Uh, so you have two here and two there. And uh, please come and receive both. And then go sit back down at your, at your seat and we'll together take it as a church family. So let us let us do that. Body broken for you, babe. It's body broken for you. 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 It's body broken for you, Linda. It's body broken for you, Miss Jenny. Body broken for you, Abby. Huh? It's body broken for you, Miss Anne. It's body broken for you, Chip. It's 
body broken for you, Charlie. This body broken for you. This body broken for you. Great. This body broken for you. Jane. It's body broken for you, Michael. It's body broken for you, Thomas. It's body broken for you, Jonah. It's body broken for you, Sarah. It's body broken for you, Thomas. It's body broken for you, Ryan. broken for you a dare blood shed for you a dare amen and to quote the great theologian, can't remember his name, but he said to the effect, you know, take and eat, that phrase offered in the garden, uh, take and eat, which meant destruction. Uh, well, Christ would have to go through poverty and death to redeem that phrase, take and eat. So this is what we're here celebrating this morning. Uh, Paul says in his word, but in the following instructions, or excuse me, I'm sorry, he says, I see from the Lord that which I also delivered to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us receive the bread by faith. Similar fashion, uh, on that same night, the Lord then took the cup and said, This cup is a new covenant in my blood shed for the forgiveness of your sins. Drink ye all of it. Let us pray. Lord, nothing in our hands we bring, simply, simply to your cross we cling. Um, there's nothing that we can do to merit eternal life, nothing we can do to, to merit your smile. It is faith in Christ. And Lord, these elements point to uh, the reality of Christ's body broken and bloodshed for us. It, was, it took nothing less to redeem us as your people. And Lord, I pray that this would be both a time of reflection but also a time of joyful celebration for we will be seated around the lamb's wedding supper enjoying the same so lord this is a foretaste and lord i pray that this would n nourish us nourish our faith so that we can then go out and share the good news with those in need of christ in his name we pray amen well just as they did thank you ryan just as they did uh there in the upper room they sang a song together and let us do the same if you would please stand. And Julie, what is the song? Power in the blood. Power in the blood. <clears throat>
come up. I, brother Martin's going to offer our benediction here this morning. Thank you, brother. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Amen.